Welcome to the chapel of Robinson College here at the University of Cambridge. This term we are listening to voices from outside the window and today we're delighted to welcome Professor Ron Purser who speaks about his latest book McMindfulness, how mindfulness became the new capitalist spirituality. Ron Purser is a professor of management, a practicing Buddhist and a vocal critic of the corporatized mindfulness movement. He has recently been appointed Lam Larson Distinguished Research Professor at Lam Family College of Business, San Francisco State University. Ron Purser, a very warm welcome to Robinson College Chapel. Can you... Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Simon. Could I get you to say something then about your background in, in Buddhism and um, Buddhist practices and how you came to write this book? Sure. Uh, well, that kind of goes back to my mid-20s. Uh, I was still an undergraduate in college and uh, I was a psychology student. But uh, even before that, I was, you know, kind of exploring, dabbling, various spiritualities and uh, sort of pop zen, you know, Alan Watts and things like that. But it wasn't until my mid-20s that I actually discovered this Tibetan uh, Buddhist Institute in Berkeley, California. And I started taking classes there around 1982, 1983. Um, and to make a long story short, went to graduate school uh started uh, practicing zen in cleveland ohio because that was the only buddhist center in cleveland ohio at the time so i had some exposure to zen uh tibetan buddhism uh, mainly those two uh traditions uh have been uh with me for a long time yeah i suppose it, uh, and oh the book yeah <laughs> yeah in terms of the book um yeah, so that is, I think, very important because in the background, um, I had been practicing various forms of meditation, not necessarily uh, mindfulness meditation as it's known today. Um, but I'm sitting here in San Francisco, and uh, San Francisco at one time was kind of the hotbed for beatniks and the countercultural revolution and the uh, you know, the times of the hippies and Zen and other Buddhist uh, schools such as Tibetan Buddhism were very, very popular back then, but more as uh, a countercultural sort of uh, force, an anti-establishment uh, sort of bohemian uh, uh, countercultural uh interest that, that, that the interest in, in Buddhism was, was uh, very countercultural. And so, you know, I started seeing how companies in Silicon Valley started to become very uh, interested in mindfulness meditation and corporate mindfulness programs were starting to emerge, especially uh, in Google. Uh, they were one of the first. So I guess it was the intersection of all those vectors that uh, made me start to pay attention to what is this mindfulness revolution. It kind of baffled me how it suddenly morphed into this countercultural uh, uh, force. Culture, and it, which culture pardon? were they running counter to? Well, at the time in the '60s, that was uh, running counter to everything that was considered what was called the establishment, um, with okay. the Vietnam War protest and. Um, there was kind of a, a mistrust of corporations, corporate centers of power, government, um, anti-materialism, you know, the commune movement was established uh, during that time. Um, but, uh, you know, suddenly, like around 2010 or so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mindfulness movement started taking off. And then by the time I wrote the book, uh, it was a $1.5 billion industry, and we saw some of the key mindfulness leaders or teachers uh, being received at the World Economic Forum in Davos. So I said, whoa, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. um, and then the media really latched onto it, 
in terms of promoting it as the mindfulness revolution, you know, that came probably the signature event for that was the Time Magazine special issue, which featured this very youthful, attractive blonde woman on the cover uh, with her eyes closed, kind of blissed out. That was kind of the iconic figure <laughs> of this. And so there was a lot of hype going on in the media, a lot of enthusiasm. And I began to, you know, keep track of what was going on. And I said, I think it's time for me to write this book. Um, and more as kind of a, a way to counterbalance all the positive presentation of mindfulness, all the uncritical, popular self-help writing that was out there. And in order to cut through the noise and the hype, I, I had to choose more of a polemical style uh, to kind of uh, get people's attention. So it, it's meant to be an ideological critique um, of the mindfulness revolution. And... Um, yeah, that's kind of what spurred me on to uh, to writing it. It, it follows on from um, a, an article that you'd written that went viral on Huffington Post. Was yeah. It, um, McMindfulness, Beyond McMindfulness. Yeah. Yeah, that was a two th 2013 article, July 1st, 2013. I co-authored that with my friend David Loy, who uh, uh, is uh, known as a, a socially engaged Buddhist. He's kind of... Uh, pioneer in that area and uh yeah it was only like 1100 words it was a really short essay and that was my first stab at actually writing for the media uh outside of academia right and i i joked to a lot of my colleagues i said you know that article had more impact than any academic journal article in my entire uh 30 35 year career in academia <laughs> Um, and it, it did stir quite a debate, and uh, it really did kind of uh, uh, get people to uh, begin to question, um, you know, the, the claims and uh, uh, the basic ideological uh, tenets of, of the mindfulness revolution. So, uh, yeah, that's right. Around 2013, it's kind of when it got on my radar. Yeah. And you mentioned... Um some of the gurus of the mindfulness movement, in particular, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, um, who I, I still can't quite believe he's the son-in-law of Howard yeah. Zinn, a brilliant historian who... That it, must it have been an interesting relationship. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, John Kabat-Zinn did not respond well to this phrase, muck mindfulness. Um, and it, um, it seems... Well, mm -hmm. well, it's interesting. Um, maybe not at first, but <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny because I, after a period of time, um, he started, I think he wanted to get on the right side of history, so he started to actually agree that McMindfulness was a problem in some of the interviews with him. Um, but, you know, really, basically what that was saying was like, well, we're not doing McMindfulness. But mindfulness is a problem, you know. So distancing but, himself you know. from it whilst recognizing its validity as a critique. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe so. And yeah. yeah. So we before we launch in in more detail to the, to your critique of mindfulness, can, mm -hmm. um, with your background in uh, meditation and so on, can you say something about the positive? value of mindfulness because you don't dismiss it outright at all yeah either. that's right I, I i try to make that clear in the book um that i'm not dismissing uh the individual therapeutic benefits uh, nor am i trying to defend traditional buddhist approaches either uh, but what i am trying to do is to stress the need for more of uh, a critical collective attention to the systematic problems that are generating uh, the stressful conditions in our uh, culture in the first place. That said, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with using mindfulness to de-stress. Mm -hmm. And mindfulness programs were designed uh, as clinical programs, uh, therapeutic methods, uh, as a palliative intervention for self-managing uh, chronic stress and anxiety, and that's all well and good. Um, 
and there's no doubt in my mind, uh, given what I've seen in some of the better uh, scientific articles, is that people have derived uh, some very modest, salutary uh, mental health benefits from these techniques. So mm-hmm. I don't <clears throat> see anything inherently wrong with doing a three-minute breathing exercise or turning to headspace or calm on your smartphone or well, taking a breath. A yeah, <laughs> or taking a, a short breath before sending off an email or something like that. Uh, uh, so, yeah, there are th- clinical and therapeutic benefits to mindfulness, um, and certainly the side effects are becoming more calm, less anxious, mm-hmm. more self-aware of one's tendency to be uh, hijacked by uh, uh, thoughts and feelings that uh, can spiral downward into associations that uh, lead to further ruminations and, and distraction and all those sorts of things. So, Can I ask uh, you, does it work best in a situation that you cannot change? Sometimes you're in an environment, the environment can't be changed. You've got to learn how to deal with where you are. Yeah. Is it is that the the place where it works best where you cannot change the context in which you found yourself um you cannot change the difficulties that you're facing in bereavement for instance you, you're not uh-huh. going to bring somebody back right um does it well, work best in those circumstances that's an interesting question i think it could but you know i there there have been people talking about how mindfulness could be misused as a form of spiritual bypassing. In other words, that maybe these difficult... I know that mindfulness teachers say that they really teach people to turn towards these difficult feelings, but I don't know if all mindfulness teachers teach it that way. And some people may misuse it not intentionally but as a way to avoid going through uh, grief for example to avoid those feelings of grief as a form of spiritual bypassing and um, there are also studies coming out now about uh, the adverse effects of some mindfulness meditation techniques that may be uh, contraindicated for people that are, have suffered trauma that actually practicing mindfulness can actually re-trigger, uh, actually increase their anxiety. There's there's a, a lot of good research coming out of Brown University on that. Um, but I think overall, I would say yes to your question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll move you to the next one then, because it's almost the exact opposite, um, which is in a place like uh, Cambridge, uh, when people speak about a mental health academic, uh, and that language seems to be everywhere, the root causes seem to be that the future, particularly that our young people are facing, is one of economic and ecological gloom, to put it mildly. And I, I wonder, can you explain how mindfulness can be used to train the victims of injustice to to live with rather than to challenge injustices? Yes, I think that's a really key question. Um, And this is where the leaders in the mindfulness movement have misdiagnosed (laughs) uh, these issues in in terms of our cultural malaise um, and this mental health epidemic that the way they uh, have presented it in the narrative is that people are distracted and caught up in their mental ruminations. And so if only people were more mindful of the present moment, then their worlds would be infinitely more fulfilling. And uh, that diagnosis to me sounds just a little too convenient. Uh, that distress that young people are experiencing uh, supposedly uh, has nothing to do with their actual material conditions or the economic conditions, uh, the unreasonable demands being placed on uh, people at work, the gig economy, uh, whatever it may be. And this is where the, the narrative of stress has become 
depoliticized in terms that it's explained as a private, subjective, and interior affair, that a, pro a problem, stress is a problem that the individual needs to take responsibility for on their own. And it's interesting that uh, this is what the late critical psychologist David Smale, who worked at the NHS, uh, refers to as magical voluntarism, where the burden and locus of uh, psychological distress is uh, entirely depends on the will uh, of the individual to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps despite the conditions that they may find themselves in. So in McMindfulness, in the book, I, I challenge that dominant narrative. I mean, that's really kind of perhaps one of the threads throughout the book is that this privatization of the causes of stress has allowed mindfulness to operate and function ideologically as a new capitalist spirituality. Uh, and so we, we see now in late capitalist society that in, in, in Buddhist parlance or in Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist teachings, they talk about the three root mental poisons, which historically, I mean, even Buddhism was not socially engaged or even concerned with um, improving a lot of the collective either. Um, but these three root poisons, greed, hatred, and delusion, are now uh, uh, social poisons or collective poisons. They've been institutionalized. Uh, so human suffering can no longer be, or stress, for, if we want to be more exact, can no longer just be seen as an individual problem. Uh, and these afflictions are proliferated in our society that you know, they're infecting the media, corporations, uh, the whole social character of our culture. And, then, and, and so social suffering is a term I like to use, that suffering is, is, is uh, there's a kind of interdependent, interlocking nature, uh, kind of an overdetermined set of factors that are causing stress. Um, and the individual is part of that system, it's, uh, but it's to focus only on the individual, then that becomes a, uh, a neoliberal sort of ethos um, where we're viewing suffering or stress as purely a private matter, something the individual must overcome through self-care or mindfulness. Uh, and the mindfulness teachers, I don't even know if they're aware of it, but actually the language that they use actually kind of almost seamlessly uh, resonates with a neoliberal agenda because they tell people that uh, just to accept things as they are, you know, and that whole shifting the burden of responsibility to individuals for managing their own well-being essentially basically privatizes stress as well. And... Um, so mindfulness again is 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 a highly individualistic spirituality. It's uh, perfectly accommodated now to our economic values. Um, and my friend Richard King, who used to be the chair of Buddhist studies at the University of Kent, he wrote a remarkable book which really influenced me. Uh, the, the word accommodationist comes from him. He, he wrote a book called Selling Spirituality. Oh, yeah. the, the silent takeover of religion. And so great. mindfulness has this, has this accommodation, this orientation, yeah. which calms our feelings of anxiety and stress. Uh, and it works as that palliative for the individual. Um, it occurs to me as you're speaking, but, this is what the Greeks called idiocy. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Um, that's right. I remember, uh, I remember that. Um, yeah, because it's basically creating a, a form of social amnesia or social myopia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's this neoliberal turn inward mm. to work on oneself, and it creates this massive blind spot then towards the political and the polis, the social. Uh, and, uh, because you say, I think, uh, at, at times, some of the gurus, the leaders of the movement now will say, oh, yes, well, if everyone's doing this, society will become a better place. Uh -huh. It's the only way to save the future of humanity. But it yeah. never gets beyond the individual. 
you're saying. It's right. Almost. It's yeah, they have. So there's no they, such thing in society. No, their vision of of social change is highly individualistic. One mindful individual at a time is mm -hmm. how you change society. Um, there's no talk about increasing taxes on the rich or uh, any kind of uh, reparations or <laughs> anything structural or systemic. Um, but that just reflects this privatization of spirituality. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's kind of a uh, a form of cruel optimism, as uh, uh, Laura Berlant would put it. Um, we're told that if we, if you're only mindful enough, then everything will kind of work out. Your book is full of one example after another after another. Every one of them, completely striking, and you're almost pulling back the curtain curtain on the ludicrous nature of how people find this convincing. But I suppose the, the flip side, one of the objections that you will no doubt have heard um, to yeah. what you're saying um, is that if you're somebody that's done their one hour a day's training for eight weeks and you're now teaching mindfulness, um, you can't fix the great problems of society. Uh, the mental health pandemic can't be fixed. Uh, all you can do is deal with the person in front of you. And as one, one reviewer uh, says, uh, we do not condemn a doctor who treats the victims of war for failing to devote his efforts instead to eliminating the root causes of war. Uh, how, how do you respond to that kind of criticism? Yeah, well, I like that doc doctor uh, example because it's a false equivalency right from the start. And... Uh, if we're going to make a comparison to a doctor, then we should focus then on uh, the mindfulness teachers, the trainers, the consultants, and the coaches. If they're the one that's offering these uh, interventions. So let's do that. Let's, let's look at a typical, let's say, a typical corporate mindfulness trainer. Uh, that person set up shop in the marketplace. They have to sell and deliver these programs to companies like Ford Motor or HSBC Bank or whatever corporation it might be. And we know this segment's become a burgeoning industry for consultants and trainers. And th the last time I looked uh, at a market research report, it said that mindfulness forecast to become a $2 billion industry by 2022. So this whole kind of market friendliness should in itself kind of make us a little bit skeptical. Uh, but their livelihood, I mean, their livelihood depends on, on selling these programs, securing contracts. So we have to ask ourselves, are they really dealing with the root causes of stress in corporations? Uh, and I would definitely answer no. First, corporate, you know, as I said, the corporate mindfulness programs like, uh, like therapeutic programs are designed uh, to focus on individual stress relief. So... My issue is that the diagnosis has already been made even before beginning such a program, even before they enter the corporation. Uh, but we know from the research on, on workplace stress that the real root causes of stress are not the failure of individuals at all. They're, uh, they're, it's not the failure of, of, of employees to cope or focus or lack of focus, but it's the systemic and structural factors, whether it's unrealistic job demands or long work hours, bad bosses, uh, lack of autonomy at work, uh, lack of health care, fear of being laid off and being made redundant. Um, so those celebrating the mindfulness movement, such as these consultants, have avoided uh, these more systemic diagnoses of, of stress in the workplace. And I use the example in the book of David Gellis, who wrote this book, Mindful Work, and he has a quote that stress isn't something imposed on us. It's something we impose on ourselves. Uh, and this goes right back to the privatization of stress that I just mentioned. So um, trying to address stress in the workplace through the individual at the individual level is not going to address the, the structural and material conditions that are the real causes of corporate stress. And what that does is it lets management off the hook for taking responsibility for such conditions, stressful conditions. And and all, another thing about that metaphor about the doctor is we're talking about chronic stress, not battle wounds. And 
uh, like mindfulness, the concept of stress is, can be very hard to pin down. Uh, and it's that ambiguity around that term that should make us a bit wary of accepting the popular discourse because uh, it kind of sends a signal of in inevitability. You know, stress is an epidemic, uh, and you have to mindful up. Uh, mm -hmm. And this, this discourse of stress has ideological components that the whole industry is kind of uh, uh, organized itself around this idea of the individual stress subject. Uh, and what that does then is it, it basically depoliticizes stress and reinterprets it uh, as a purely a biological maladaptation to the environment of the individual. And uh, But if we take this doctor of medical analogy a bit further, um, Imagine a physician who uh, is treating a, a patients with dysentery, and uh, they live in an area with a contaminated water supply. So the physician uh, makes a misdiagnosis and attributes the source of their diarrhea uh, to uh, something that uh, is wrong with their intestines. and. They begin focusing on providing medications that will provide temporary benefits, but the diarrhea is, is going to come right back because they haven't really dealt with the contaminated water supply. And so I see this misdiagnosis, mm -hmm. treating dysentery, sort of the analogy with mindfulness techniques by teaching people, uh, really doesn't really get at the root causes. Um, and I think one of the issues of the example that I use with the corporate mindfulness trainers is because they have a vested interest in not dealing with the root causes. Yes, exactly. It'd be a hard, it would be a hard sell to try to sell a program. So we're going to come in, we'd like to ask you some difficult questions about why your people are so stressed out and what some of the structural and systemic factors are. You've got a great example. I don't know how well you can remember the specific examples that you have written up. But there's a great example of a protest outside Google. You had oh, oh, yes. That was Wisdom to, Wisdom 2.0 conference, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. That was just brilliant, where you become mindful of the protesters outside and how they're interfering with your... Can't, but being mindful of those protesters doesn't mean listening to them. Yeah, you're referring to that uh, now very well popularized incident, incident that happened at this uh, conference in San Francisco called Wisdom 2.0, which is really a, a kind of a gathering of uh, people that are in technology uh, and mindfulness, uh, uh, spiritual entrepreneurs that are selling various things related to mindfulness and yeah, Google was presenting. They were on stage, and uh, uh, there were some protesters that uh, basically stormed the stage, actually got into the conference, and they were protesting Google's uh, contribution to the gentrification of San Francisco, the increase in rents, the, uh, the Google buses uh, that were dominating the streets of San Francisco, they had a whole host of things that they were uh, pr protesting about and caused quite a ruckus, uh, disrupted the, uh, the presentation. And one of the mindfulness teachers that was on the stage uh, basically said, okay, why don't we all just, uh, just pay attention to our breath now as we um, take in people with different points of view than us. And as, as, as they were doing that, these very burly guys uh, that were like bouncers, security guys came and they were, had a tug of war uh, with uh, the female protesters. And interestingly enough, these female protesters were uh, actually socially engaged Buddhists that um, uh, were out of the East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland. Uh, and they also practiced meditation as well. So they were very familiar with um, the mindfulness movement too but anyway the security guards uh, got them off stage and then they went uh, uh, just about their business uh, with the presentation as if nothing ever happened 
I thought Wisdom 2.0 was your amusing description of it, not a name that they'd given to themselves with a straight face. Yeah, it's their name. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. I, I misattributed the humor there then when I was listening to that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's also interesting too that... Um, I read an article recently, or I didn't read it completely, but it really, I scanned it, but um, it was from someone in the UK. It was uh, a, uh, Rodrigo Brito, and he's at the University of Nottingham. Mm -hmm. And he came out with a really interesting article that mindfulness-based interventions uh, can have very positive, what he calls side effects, such as concentration and individual well-being and... Um, and but the downside is that they again they adhere to this kind of neoliberalist agenda of emphasizing individual responsibility and performativity and but i like how he uh frames it and it's an interesting term another greek word well, it comes from the greek io iotrogenesis iotrogenic problem which is okay. used in in healthcare uh and he says that mbi sort of function as a form of I iotrogenesis, uh, where they basically say, okay, the systemic problems are not something we need to worry about. Let's just focus on the individual. The individual is culpable for, for stress. And um, I found that very, very, very interesting. It's a, almost a form of biopolitics where now if there's a problem with the world, it's you, you, the individual controlled, stressed person, are to blame. I think you allude to yeah, some... biopolitics. Yep. Um, yeah, this is sort of Michel Foucault talking about how populations can be controlled not just by a state doing state things, but the state can reach into your into your own most personal being and realign who you are in accordance with the interests of power, how, whatever form that takes. And the church, of course, has been guilty of this since at least the fourth century. Uh, this is something that uh, Foucault talks about at length. But because there are so many elements of um, Buddhism that are just um, bracketed out of this practice, um, and yet at times it feels that there is a sort of a, an Ikea version of Buddhism. Um, yeah. You know, a commodified Buddhism. Can you, can you say a bit more about that? Because this is, this is your world and, and you, you, you stated this very articulately throughout the book. Yeah, there's a lot in that a question and statement. I'll try to unpack it. Uh, I'd like to get back to biopolitics later again, though, too. Um, yeah, I, I, I think what we see uh, is a form of uh, epis, epistemic violence in a way in relation to mindfulness. Um, uh, you know, this is a very complex process in terms of how the West is translating Buddhism uh, into Western modern capitalist culture. And there are scholars that just have done remarkable jobs like trying to make sense of of that, uh, people like David McMahon and his book, uh, The Making of Buddhist Modernism, uh, Jeff Wilson's book called Mindful America, they, they've done like exceptional jobs at this. Um, but I think the rhetoric among the cheerleaders of mindfulness is troublesome, because um, I think there's some unacknowledged uh, colonialist attitudes going on, and they're discouraged Basically, I think you're referring to discursive habits, uh, which uh, serve as kind of rhetorical functions for turning the Buddhist branding on and off, depending on the audience that they're speaking to. Mm -hmm. um, and you even have like very prominent media figures. Uh, there's a, a TV news anchor. Uh, in the United States, his name is Dan Harris, not Sam Harris, but he's he's a, he's problematic too. But Dan <laughs> Harris, who uh, wrote a book called Ten Percent Happier," and um, Ten Percent Happier," but it's a book on on how you know mindfulness uh, 
you know, changed his life and all that. But he's very fond of denigrating Buddhism and, and uh, kind of referring it to as a kind of a culturally archaic, superstitious institution. Whereas the West, because of science, we really have extracted uh, the essence of, of Buddhism in the form of this technique called mindfulness. So you have that, uh, all these familiar tropes, right, that are um, Buddhism. Yeah, you know, you don't have to worry about all these flaky foreign uh, monks and red robes and all that stuff because now we have, uh, as Westerners, um, we have, uh, it's kind of what Evan Thompson refers to as a form of Buddhist exceptionalism and, 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 and that somehow they've been able to uh, refashion Buddhism as a science of mind. Uh, and that is really uh, part of the discursive strategy for secularizing it in a way. So in a way, when you turn the Buddhist switch on, you do it for branding prestige in a way. It it's, it's, it's comes from ancient Eastern practices, but it's not ancient Eastern practices. It's a scientific technique that's been proven to work, especially since now we can uh, put people in fMRI machines and actually see the neural correlates of meditation and mindfulness. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's put another kind of uh, stamp of legitimacy uh, on mindfulness from that point of view. So you turn the Buddhist switch on when you're at uh, conferences where you have, you know, people that are sympathetic to Buddhism, um, uh, but you certainly turn the Buddhist switch off if you're writing a grant to a federal fa funding agency uh, to receive uh, government funding for your research. You turn the Buddhist switch off if you're trying to sell it to a corporation or to a public school. Um, and that, to me, has uh, always been felt disingenuous to me and, and uh, problematic uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the way that they've um, almost uh, uh, used Buddhism as a form of cultural cachet uh, and while well, at the same time denigrating it as nothing but outmoded cultural accretions from the East. And the same people can adopt both approaches. Oh, it's yes. It is the same people. Yeah. yeah. They it, talk out of both sides of their own mouth, basically, if you want to be blunt about it. Yeah. <laughs> they want to have it both ways. And, and it's interesting that uh, Thupten uh, Jingpa, who is, uh, was formerly a... Uh, uh, a Tibetan monk, he was the translator for many years for the holiness, his holiness, the Dalai Lama. Oh, yes. He really called them, yeah, he really called them out on that uh, at a conference at McGill. And he said, look, you guys say it, it's secular and then you say it's from Buddhism. You can't have it both ways. Which one is it? <laughs> he was like, well, come on. <laughs> um, and... Um, and he actually wrote another article that came out a couple of years ago. He said, you know, maybe it's more useful or more skillful if we just say that mindfulness is very different than Buddhist mindfulness. And, and why don't we just cut out the whole Buddhist part and just go off and do your own thing? You know, why, why do you have to invoke Buddhism for it? It'll, it'll, I think that would be a more honest approach. <laughs> Let me move to, to a final major question, which I, I think we'll probably touch on biopolitics. Yeah. And that's just a simple question of why um, yeah. banks, why the military, why the giants of Silicon Valley are forking out so much money for mindfulness courses. Why, why are they doing that? Yeah, well, I think there are a number of reasons. And well, let's start with corporations. And first of all, you know, there's the Gallup poll that shows that billions, like $300 billion are being lost due to stress-related absences uh, in the workplace 
uh, maybe even more that, like I think it was 500 billion uh, in losses due to a lack of uh, employee engagement is the term. So it, that sh then should be no surprise why the corporate sector has really uh, struck an interest in, in the mindfulness bandwagon. Uh, because these losses are, are a threat to profit making, obviously. So and that's one reason. And on the basis that this is good for employee productivity. Yeah, yeah. Productivity. Yeah, yeah. Mind the way you get the foot in the door in a corporation. If you're uh, a corporate consultant or trainer, as you say, it, it's going to improve productivity. Yeah, it's definitely that's definitely the, one of the key selling points. But I also think that. It, it serves a bit as a form of virtual signaling, too. Um, because like Google, which is a big supporter of mindfulness, um, it can send, a, you know, to signal it's, uh, it's a culture, it's a caring environment, you know, besides the free gourmet food and the dry cleaning and the pool tables that we, we really care about the psychological and spiritual needs of our employees. So it's, uh, it's uh, kind of a, uh, form of uh, virtue signaling, and uh, uh, you know, I think they've done a good job of that. Um, uh, you know, so s it's interesting that you know small groups of employees will get palliative benefits from mindfulness. Um, they can de, de stress, they'll cope a little bit better with the demands of the workplace. Uh, but what I find ironic is that they'll continue to downplay the externalities that are being exported. And in this case, if we're talking about Google or Facebook, it's the digital pollution that's being exported by these companies. They're technologies of distraction by design. And um, so here we have software engineers that are becoming more mindful, more focused, more concentrated, so they can keep producing technologies of mass distraction and addiction. Um, the other thing that I think is that mindfulness sort of looks like a contemporary form of the Protestant work ethic, uh, kind of a salvic force yeah. for tolerating uh, these oppressive working conditions or a promise of better career success. Uh, uh, and we, we see this whole kind of quest among utilitarian thinkers going all the way back to Jeremy Bethan, um, where, you know, how can we tap into <clears throat> the psyche of employees? And this is where we get back into what Byung Chul Han calls uh, neoliberal psychopolitics, uh, uh, kind of a different twist on biopower. Mm. Um, so mindfulness then is kind of packaged and framed as a skill that it's, it becomes a new way to invest in mental capital, human mental capital. But presumably, so, in that yeah. light, then, if you feel angry or you, or you have actual compassion, not this fake empathy, but actual empathy that manifests itself in something significant, th these things are treated as sin that you must use mindfulness to overcome. Is, is that how yeah. it works? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, corporate mindfulness, it works very subtly to train employees to conform. Uh, it's not a form of industrial brainwashing or anything like that. Like some mindfulness teachers say, well, well, it's not brainwashing. Yeah, I know it's not brainwashing, but it, it basically is a subtle form of biopolitics, which functions to deflect attention away from collective organizing or the pursuit of structural changes. And instead, it refocuses uh, attention on um, productive self-discipline. Uh, and in that case, that's how it works as a, as a form of biopower because it's trying to bind people's inner lives to corporate success. Um, and and so the corporate takeover of mindfulness will ensure that it will never be a challenge to corporate capitalism uh, in that respect. Um, it's interesting. It's very close with regards to yeah. It's close Go to ahead. the roots of poverty in the sense that it's rooted in this idea that you cower beneath 
what's there. That's, I think that's the root sense of what poverty is. And you're teaching these people to cower beneath, never to question, never to challenge, never to rock the boat. It feels like a, a learning how to police yourself into accepting the status quo. Yeah, self-policing is exactly it. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I'll give you an example of something I just saw the other day um, on Twitter. <laughs> um, Amazon. Um, Amazon employees, there's a new program that, they, that they're offering their warehouse uh, employees called Amazon. Amazon. It's the Working Well program at Amazon. Uh, I just saw this and we, you know, that there's been these, uh, uh, attempts to unionize Amazon here in the United States and that, uh, and Amazon's poured m tons of money into anti-union campaigns. But now we have this mindfulness, uh, program that are, uh, located in these interactive kiosk that employees can then. Uh, kind of go to these kiosks and watch these short guided meditations at their workstations. And uh, uh, evidently these workstations are going to prompt uh, the Amazon uh, warehouse employee every hour or at a certain time to start engaging in mindfulness breathing exercises. So then they could get back to their <laughs> sweatshop. Um, and then Starbucks is another one that um, I remember an article about how the baristas and frontline workers at Starbucks were put together a petition saying, hey, we need better staffing. The morale is low. We're really stressed out. And we're not getting enough hours to have our health care benefits because you need a certain amount of hours. And so they were feeling very stressed out. They couldn't pay their rent. And. So what did corporate management do? They made an announcement that they'd be gifting all their employees the Headspace mindfulness, mindfulness meditation app. There you go. You got stress? Well, here's an app. Get over it. And that's, uh, that's uh, I think, uh, sums it up. That's a great place to finish. Uh, thank you very much, Ron Purser. Thank you.